There are many ways to design and make mechanical sculpture or automata. This program features the work of Keith Newstead, who makes most of his machines with simple mechanisms from readily available materials. After training as a graphic designer, Keith developed his craft skills by making jewellery. But he's always been interested in machines and began making automata over ten years ago. As well as introducing basic mechanisms, this program will show some of the methods that Keith uses in his own work. This cardboard prototype has most of the elements found in automata, such as gearing, cams and levers. The gears slow down the speed of the handle, giving more time for the figure to go through its routine. There are two cams and two levers. One lever pulls the glass to the lips, while the other turns the bottle to the glass. In the first part of this program, we're going to look at some simple mechanisms and how they work. In the second part, I'm going to show you how to make automata. But first I'm going to show you some of the machines I've made over the past few years. This machine was made for a satellite television company. This is one of my less tasteful machines. It's called the Great Chop Handoff, and uh, basically what it does is it appears to chop your hand off. Welcome. I am the Great Chop Handoff. Move your fingers in the gauntlet while I summon up my mystical powers. One. This flying train might look quite complicated, but all machines, however complex, are based on very simple mechanisms. We have divided the basic mechanisms into eight sections. Starting with levers. I've built this to show two different uses for the same lever. It's pivoted quite near one end. And when I pull it back and release it, there's a short, powerful movement here, which is turned into a further but weaker movement here. And this will propel the object across the room, hopefully. This lever can also be used to lift heavy weights. In this case, this long, weak force, I'm just using one finger, is turned into a short, very powerful force, which lifts the three bricks. Levers are often used to make work easier, but putting less work in means you have to move the lever a greater distance. When you design a mechanism that uses a lever, remember that it moves through the arc of a circle, not in a straight line. Attached to this lever is a string which passes around the back of the train driver, through a hole in the back of his head, through the mouth 
and it's then attached to his drink. As the lever is pushed down, the string is tightened and the drink is pulled up to the driver's lips. This makes the figure lean back as if he's drinking. As the lever comes back up, the driver can lean forward again. In order to keep the lever in contact with the can, I've fitted this small spring. It's quite lightly sprung, so there's not much resistance. It's just enough to keep the lever against the can. Springs are useful because they can be twisted or pulled or squashed, but still return to their original shape when the twisting, pulling or squashing stops. In this case, the spring is keeping the wings together. The first part we're going to look at on this piece of automata is the handle. This is basically a lever, which is known as a crank. Behind the handle, there's another crank. This pushes on a rod, which is attached to the horse. This pushes the horse up and down. These three automatons look very different, but they all work on the same basic mechanical principle. This is known as the crank slider, and here's a larger model I've made to show you how it works. As the crank turns, it pushes the slider arm up and down through the pivot point. The position of the pivot point will affect the travel of the slider. works in the same way as a lever, but it's usually used on a rotating shaft. For instance, the pistons in a car engine move up and down, causing the crankshaft to rotate. We can use the extra motion the crank gives us to add extra movement to the pig. This is done with linkages. The legs are attached to thin strings, and as the pig rises, the strings are pulled taut, causing the legs to rise in the air. The wings are attached to thin wires. As the pig rises, the wings drop down, and as the pig falls, the wings are pushed back up by the wires. A linkage can be made from levers, cranks and connecting rods. They are used to change the type, direction or amount of motion. This four bar linkage turns the rotary motion of the bar on the right into the side to side motion of the bar on the left. Here two levers are being used to make the leg kick. The first lever in the form of a bell crank changes the direction of motion, while the second lever, the leg, turns a small movement into a large movement. This cam and lever is the same as the ones I used in the cardboard drinking man that you saw at the start of the program. The elastic band keeps the lever in contact with the cam, while the two guides stop the lever from slipping off the edge of the cam. This is a dog chasing its towel. It works because the egg-shaped cam underneath pushes, then turns by friction, the wooden disc above it. Because this isn't very efficient, it results in the jerky movement of the dog above. This is a prototype for a cutout called the Flying Doctor. Instead of the crank slider that I used in the Flying Pig, this one uses a cam. 
The cam is a circle of card which is rotating off centre. The most common type of cam rotates against a follower which tracks the shape of the cam's profile. If you try to make a small cam produce large movements, you may find that the friction and leverage on the follower cause it to jam. You also need to think about which direction the cam will rotate in. The Chopandov is controlled by a large timing cam, which is driven by a motor that starts when the coin is dropped. This timing cam operates switches, which then turn on other motors. It's made from a piece of sole pipe, and the raised bits that operate the switches are made from strips of an old leather belt. The second cam is attached to the timing cam. This operates the mouth in sync with the tape recording of Chopandov's voice. The way I did this was to put a pencil lead in where this lever bar is now, play the tape while the cam revolved and just move it with my hand so the pencil lead left a mark on the cam. Once that was done I cut out the profile, replayed the tape and the lever was put in which then followed the mark I previously made which meant that the mouth followed the tape exactly. The bearing is the part which supports a rotating shaft. Even when the bearings are simply two holes drilled in wood, you should still make sure that they align with each other and are the right size, allowing free rotation without side movement. I spend a lot of time finding old machinery and taking it to bits to see how it works. Um, this is actually part of a ticket printing machine, and this part here is the guillotine which cuts the ticket off to the required length. If I push it across, you can see the blade goes down, chops the ticket and then comes back up again. Because this machine has to work accurately thousands of times, it's very well engineered. You can see the bearings here and here that cut down the friction as the metal parts touch against the metal parts. You may not need to use bearings like this all the time, but they are useful in fast-moving machines or where there is a heavy load on the shaft. Cutting down on friction and helping to keep parts in alignment are useful ways to prevent wear and keep a machine working correctly. If I need to make something that moves freely in my work, like this bicycle wheel, I use brass rods. These slide in one another, but with enough gap to allow a film of oil, which breaks down any wear that might occur. A ratchet can be used to give intermittent or stepped motion, as opposed to the continuous motions we've looked at so far. The Geneva wheel is another type of intermittent mechanism. It is used in cine cameras and projectors to step the film on frame by frame. The shutter opens when the wheel pauses. As well as giving stepped motion, ratchets are also used to allow rotation in one direction only. This model winch is fitted with a ratchet. This part's known as the pawl, and it locates with these teeth, meaning that I can only wind the handle in one direction. If I release the pawl, you can see what happens. When I was designing this train, I knew that some parts would need to move faster than others. This arrangement of gears gives two different speeds. The faster speed is used in this pulley which drives the wheels and wings, while the slower speed is used on the cam, which controls the movement of the train driver. Gearing is used to change the speed and power delivered. 
It is possible to make gearing mechanisms which may disobey conventional rules. They may be crude and inefficient, but they can also be adequate for their purpose. I made this worm gear from an old washer which I cut, bent and then soldered onto a brass rod. The pinwheel that it's driving is made from panel pins with their heads cut off. When the load on cogs isn't too great, they can be made quite crudely and from quite weak materials such as cardboard. The handle is connected to the small wheel with the four paddles. These push against the teeth in the gear wheel. Because this sprocket, the back sprocket, is much smaller than the pedal sprocket, it means that the pedals turn quite slowly. If I wanted to make the pedals turn more quickly, I'd need to put a bigger sprocket here. A drive is a method of connecting rotating shafts together. The drive mechanism may also involve gearing or changing the plane or direction of rotation between the shafts. The wheels on this bicycle are driven by friction, while the pedals are driven by a chain. The chain's a positive drive, that means it can't slip, whereas the wheels will slip if I put them under any resistance. On my bicycle, the road's moving. This drives the back wheel, which then drives the chain, which then drives the pedals. This is the opposite of what would happen on a real bicycle. Drives can be split into two main types, friction and positive. This is a positive drive because the chain is kept locked to the sprocket wheel by its teeth. This is a friction drive because it relies on the friction between the string and the pulley wheel. <laughs> This is a prototype I've made of a mermaid. It's made just from paper. Um, I make them from paper first just to make sure everything's going to work OK. And then I can use the paper as a pattern to cut the brass out. And it's actually driven by an elastic band here. Um, elastic bands are quite good because there's a lot of friction, but they're quite bad because there's a lot of stretch. So if they're put under, under any sort of tension, they'll just um, stop, basically, and slip around the pulley. When I actually come to making this from brass, the base would probably be quite similar to this one. Um, this is the dragon. It should just slot on. The mechanics on this dragon are the same as the mermaid. This sort of drive belt used is a commercially available type that are used for model steam engines. Like, like the elastic band, they're springy and stretchy, so you get plenty of friction. Um, unlike the elastic band, they're a lot stronger and they don't stretch quite as much. There's enough friction to drive all the parts in this dragon. The handle on this cat, which is eating fish, connects with this small pulley. This in turn connects to the larger pulley via a spring drive belt. Because this pulley is only half the size of this one, it means that I have to turn the handle twice to make this pulley turn around once. If you notice the two pulleys on this cat-eating fish are both going in the same direction, anti-clockwise. If I want this pulley to go anti-clockwise and this one to go clockwise, then I need to put a twist in the belt. And on this one, this pulley goes anti-clockwise and this one goes clockwise. I can hear a train.
there are many different ways of achieving the same result. In part two, we will see some of the ways that Keith solves problems when he is designing and making automata. The diameter of wooden doweling often varies, so it's worth checking that you use the right size drill bit. just drilled a couple of test holes to get a tight fit for this piece of dowel. Um, this one's a bit too big, I can't really pack it with glue because I don't think it would hold, so what I'm going to do is actually sand down the end of the dowel and get a really good tight fit in this hole, which at the moment is slightly too small. Keith usually produces an overall sketch of a new idea. If any of the details are complicated, he may make further drawings, but he prefers to solve his problems on the workbench by making prototypes in cardboard or plywood. Even a simple piece of automata will usually have at least 20 different parts, so it's useful to be able to make quick prototypes from scrap materials. This way you'll discover the problems quickly and save time in the long run. A jigsaw like this is one of the most useful tools for people who make automata on the same scale as Keith. It is fast, accurate and will also cut thin metal. Nearly all new machines involve some experimentation. Keith often makes parts, or even the whole piece, roughly. He then discards this and starts again from scratch. I've made a series of holes in this lever so that I can find a suitable pivot point when everything is connected. The uh, 
further along I pivot it, the more movement there'll be at this end. But I'm going to try it at that for now. And, um, I'm going to fit this spring on. This is kind of the return spring. And actually, when the lever gets to the notch in the cam, it will actually click up and that will pull down on the string and kick the leg up. Now I've got this string tied, I can work out how deep I need to make the cutout so that the foot hits the ball. So that comes to there. Looks about right. If I want to make it shallower, say there, I just need to move this pin along further. Try it now. Yeah, now it comes to there. So, if I needed to get a lot of information on this cam, I wanted the foot to do a lot of different things. I'd probably have the cutouts at about this depth because that allows me to get more on rather than up here somewhere. I could make it even more shallow. I could take it down to here by moving the pin to about there. But I think that's it's a sort of compromise, really, and I think that's a good compromise. Right, so I've got to decide which way around the cam's going to go. Um, it needs to go in an anti-clockwise direction, so that when this lever reaches this point, it jumps up like that. It's no good to go in this direction, because it won't jump into the cutout. So I know how far in it needs to go, to there. So I've just got to round the line off like this, so that it gradually lifts it back up again. Right, well I've cut my notch out of my cam, I've also cut a small indentation here. Um, I'm thinking that maybe that will make the foot quiver just before it kicks the ball, but I'm not sure yet, so the best way to find out is to turn the handle and see what happens. Ah, well it kicked the ball, but it didn't quiver. And the reason for that is because as this little indentation comes to the bar it doesn't actually drop right in as it should so what I'm going to do is glue a triangular piece on here and that should make it follow the profile of the cam a lot more accurately well it's working but I'm not really happy about this spring there's too much tension it's causing too much friction on the cam follower Although I need quite a strong spring to get the leg to kick, I don't want it so strong that, strong that it causes too much friction. So I'm going to try putting a little lengthener here, just to shorten it a bit. Right, I'm going to fit the lengthening bar. This is all trial and error, really, but you have to do it. Well, it's working a lot better now. There's half the friction there was before on the cam and the cam follower, but the leg's still kicking the ball okay, so I'm quite happy with that. The Chopandoff had a timing cam and lots of motors, whereas this machine has one motor and lots of cams. So there are five in all, and these operate the levers, which then make the various movements on the bodies. I'll stick 10p in. The disadvantage with this system is that you have to keep removing the cams to cut them and cut them to get the right profile. You'll never get it right the first time. This cam with the sharp pointy bits on it works the woman's mouth. Uh, this is the lever. It kind of flicks it up and then snaps it down so it gives her a very snappy way of talking. Which is quite apt as they're having an argument. These are the pulley wheels from the bicycle, and I'm going to show you how I made them. First of all, you need to decide the diameter of the pulley. Mark it out on a piece of wood. I use plywood. And then cut round the outline with a saw. And the next thing I need to do is cut a groove around the outside edge 
Uh, normally you'd do this on a lathe, but I, as I haven't got one, I have to use a pillar drill. To hold the wood in place in the drill while I cut a groove in the side, I'm going to use this, which is called a mandrel. So I need to drill a hole in the centre of the wood to put the small screw through. I've already got a hole where the point of the compass dug in, so I can use that as a guide. So the screw comes through and I can then attach the shank to the back. Right, so I fix, tighten this up in the drill. Put some goggles on. Start the drill. The way of making larger pulleys is to actually set this cutting bed at an angle, it's about 40 degrees, and then cut the circle out so it's actually being cut at a chamfer. And if you do this with two discs you can then stick them together and that will give you the V profile. Right, so the next thing you need to do is just sand down the rough bits. And I already drilled a small hole in the centre before I cut them out and I'm going to use this hole to, which I can put a piece of brass through and that acts as a registration point for the other half of the pulley and that's just glued together like that. This is a pulley well I've made from Perspex. Here's the bigger hole in the centre. I've also made another hole to the side. This will locate with a peg soldered to the shaft. This is to stop the pulley spinning around the shaft. Here's the peg that's soldered to the shaft. I'll just bring the wheel up, line it up and push it on. It's quite a tight fit actually. This is the figure from the bicycle, and I'm going to show you how I make it, starting from the leg joint. So the first thing to do is trace the top part of the leg down. It's important to remember to mark this pivot hole first. This arc needs to be quite accurate, and the best way to do this is to put your compass on your main drawing, get the right radius, and then draw a circle using the point you previously marked. The next thing to do on the legs is to cut two slots for this tin piece to fit into. The next thing I need to do on the knee joint is to drill a hole here so that I can pass a rod through the hole, through the hinge and back through the leg. This needs to be a tight fit so that when the rod's cut to the right length it won't slip out. The next thing to do is to mark out the hinge I'm using a piece of thin tin that can be quite easily cut with normal scissors. If you cover the tin with masking tape first, it makes it easier to see the line you've drawn. Then put the lower part of the leg here. I'm using a thinner piece of wire than this piece. Make a small mark for the centre of the lower leg part.
then draw a small circle around that point and back to the mark you first drew. You now need to drill a hole here, which should be a loose fit against the rod that will pass through the leg. And clean up the edges of the hole with a file. Just check against the leg to make sure you've got the piece the right way up. And I'm just going to do a test fit to make sure it's all OK. Take the pods and parts of the leg off and just add some more glue. It soaks into the wood quite well so it doesn't leave any kind of a mark. And that should be strong enough to hold the hinge in place once it's set. To give the leg more shape, I've sanded away some areas and carved others. The body's made from two thicknesses of wood. The side pieces look slightly thicker, and the front and back is made from this very thin plywood, which can be easily bent and moulded to shape. To make the head, I cut the profile out of a piece of wood and then carved and sanded. The nose and ears were stuck on later. The neck is made from a spring which will allow the head to wobble as the bike moves from side to side. I've drilled a small hole in this piece which fits between the two legs. This will locate the figure on the saddle. The springs in the saddle will give extra movement to the body as the legs push up and down on the pedals. I also want to get more movement in the foot, it's just hanging down at the moment, so I think if I put a peg in the knee joint and restrict the movement of the lower leg, I should be able to get the foot to kick up as it comes to the bottom of the pedal. I've put my pin in the knee joint, but it's actually just made the foot flip up in the air and there's still no movement in the foot. But I think if I put another pin down about here, it should just stop the foot rising up too far and make it flick forward again. Right. Now I've put the whole thing loosely together and I know it's going to work okay. What I have to do now is take it all to bits and paint the figure and polish the bike. I may add a few extra details as well, such as mudguards and headlamps.